Okay, you should be able to, can you hear us now? We can definitely hear you guys, yes. We're two through. Yeah. There. Okay. All right, go for it. We're recording and I think we've managed our little hiccup here. Okay. For now. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, it is uh, great to see you all both in Zoom and those of you who are kind of uh, joining in in one fashion or another there in the room. My name is Michelle Thornton and I will be presenting today. And I'm so excited because this is our kickoff officially of Access a Quest Towards Inclusion. I'm going to tell you all what that's about, give you some sneak peeks into um, this really fun, exciting new course that our campus has put a ton of effort and a lot of collective energy into developing over the last year. Uh, I am going to go ahead and share my screen. I did pop the slide deck into the uh, chat box, so you'll be able to reference that uh, later on. Uh, but of course, also, if anybody's having trouble hearing, hopefully the recording will be available uh, soon as well. We can kind of follow along that way. So uh, I am a professor in the School of Business, but I've also been a big part of our um, work group on accessibility practices, who is really the, uh, what I would say, kind of the impetus behind this work. And I want to give everybody just a little bit of background and context to, to understand kind of where it came from, what, um, what sort of the roots are of this project, and then we'll make sure to make sure that you have a good understanding of how you can either get involved or uh, take advantage of the pilot that we are kicking off today. So let's get, get at uh, a little bit of what this is. So we believe pretty strongly at Oswego that access is foundational to our mission, um, as well as a big part of how we think about DEI on campus. One form of access that we're really trying and working diligently to address is removing digital access barriers. Um, and this is both for folks with disabilities, non-native English speakers, or anybody that's experiencing kind of temporary or situational disabilities that are creating barriers. So our goal was to sort of create an easy, fun, and sustainable way for members of uh, SUNY Oswego to uh, learn some skills, increase their familiarity, build some confidence, and really join the com community of folks that are working to be more intentional, inclusive in the way that we craft and develop our digital spaces. So some background. Um, this, this work has been ongoing for several years. Some of you in the room uh, may have participated in our 10-day accessibility challenge. This first kicked off right in the heart of the pandemic, right? Everything had sort of turned upside down. We as a campus went online, and that really shone a light on and exacerbated some of the barriers that existed in the digital space. Not that they weren't present before, but it became so apparent when we were all spending so much time online. That 10 day accessibility challenge was really well received. We had uh, a ton of participation in it and a lot of really good feedback on the value of it. However, we found that it was very labor intensive. We really had to um, you know, put a lot of activity into having synchronous sessions and uh, folks just organizing, lots of folks on campus. And so while there were positive results in a variety of ways, we didn't feel that it was necessarily sustainable in the manner that we had originally created it. So as we had started talking about it though too, because because we had had that kind of positive experience, we uh, ended up presenting on it in conferences, writing papers. We, we found that other campuses were experiencing the same kind of challenges and didn't have a whole lot of good examples to go by. Um, so what we felt is that um, since we had kind of taken some leadership in this space, that we wanted to design some sort of infrastructure, some sort of kind of like ongoing standing resource that both Oswego as well as other campuses could potentially use moving forward to achieve these goals of reducing barriers in digital accessibility. So um, our work on this particular effort that we are launching today uh, started um, well, I guess a little over a year ago, because we kind of had conceptualized, had, had identified the need, decided to write for a grant through uh, the SUNY system, and then found out about a year ago that we received that grant. And that's where things really got quickly underway. Uh, we came together to kind of last summer to really do the foundational work of designing the tool that we uh, are going to be sharing, and then have met ongoing over the school year uh, to kind of keep fine-tuning that and and really uh, getting it into a place that we feel 
today is uh, kind of ready for prime time for folks to engage with and and see, uh, start giving us some feedback on it. So the, the grant came through um, the IITG program. And, and then of course we had tons of support and matches from campus, from extended learning, from CTS and from the library. So really when I say that this was um, a whole campus effort. I, I can't stress that enough. I've got just a list of the names here. You see faculty, you see staff, you see administrators, but also students have been involved in this work, both undergraduate and graduate, and just all kinds of different um, offices across the campus have been part of making this happen, so, which has made definitely um, an easier lift, but also really exciting just to see the groundswell of support behind the project. The kinds of things that we use the grant funding for, um, a big part of it was the content creation. So having faculty work uh, mm -hmm. in sort of their uh, non-contract time last summer to develop it, uh, but also to support those students as TAs in their in their work on it as well. And the last part of it, we're kind of working to create some promotional materials and some other kinds of things that that just support the project overall. One thing I'll say is that it's interesting because I think oftentimes as faculty, <laughs> we work um, and we develop our curriculums or our content in um, independently, usually. Uh, and as a group, we decided that it made a lot of sense for us to have some dedicated time where we came together and worked on that collectively. Uh, so I think for many of us, this was an unusual experience, uh, but one that we found was incredibly useful in creating a, a really high quality pro uh, product that felt cohesive, even though you had so many different people working on it. Uh, so we called these content camps and we uh, spent our time in the library last summer and we would be mm -hmm. on the computers working together. We were able to uh, share our, out our kind of ideas, our examples, our videos and get feedback real time from, uh, from everybody that was in the room. That sort of focused time, I think, allowed us to get a really strong foundation going, but also created a lot of synergy. And uh, and really, honestly, it was just fun. It helped us continue this kind of theme around building community in the space of uh, inclusivity and accessibility on campus. So with all of that kind of foundation set for you and understanding, I do want to give you a little bit of a sneak peek at what the course looks like. So there's, there's a few sort of important principles that we um, felt would kind of frame out our, our approach to this course. We wanted it to be um, online and asynchronous and, and to deploy it in Brightspace. So one thing that's important to note here is that since SUNY has gone to using Brightspace um, across all the campuses within the system, that gave us sort of a signal that, that perhaps we could create something that could be easily deployed not just within Oswego, but also to other campuses as well, if we created it using that tool. It also would allow us to kind of model some of the features within Brightspace and, and sort of work within that system that we're delivering a lot of our online content in. We wanted to make sure that we were minimizing um, any sort of ongoing manpower. So we have features like uh, a self-enrollment tool where people can go ahead and just automatically sign up for it, uh, as well as many things like auto grading of assignments and things like that. It was important to us that we were linking out uh, to as, as much as we could to um, sort of either our own resources or other best practices that are regularly updated to make sure that those things, uh, again, that kind of fed into the overall work processes as opposed to having to update things in multiple places. We wanted to uh, really make sure that this looked professional and that we had some high quality videos. So we uh, had a videographer working with us all year long. I'll show you one of those in a little bit. And then really, I think for us, I think one of the biggest things is we want to make this fun. And so, there is kind of this idea of gamifying it or uh, helping people to see really simple things that they can do to adopt principles that we're talking about throughout the course within their own workflow. And so there's many times and points along the way where we kind of give folks cues to that or give them ways to earn points. Um, we do have kind of a vision that at some point in time, there could be, for example, departments within the college, uh, participating in the challenge together and, and working towards getting high scores and things like that, that would be uh, possible future iterations of how we see this rolling out. Um, in terms of modeling accessibility, I think for us, it's really important that we 
not only are teaching folks principles of digital accessibility, but also modeling it ourselves. So really making sure that we sort of uh, walk the walk and, and showcase the, the kinds of principles that we are uh, providing tutorials on as well. So this is everything from having a really consistent template throughout the, um, the course structure, easy to read fonts, specific icons that we see show up in multiple places to try and minimize folks' cognitive load. We uh, practice, of course, use of captioning, transcripts, physical descriptions and all of our video narrations, good uh, use of uh, alternative text in our images, and we're really intentional about our choice of colors and fonts and things like that to make sure that they have the appropriate ratios. So I think that what you'll find, again, if you're familiar with any of the types of courses or challenges we've done in the past, there's a lot of the same kinds of topics that are covered. That's not to say if you've taken a course with us in the past or a training, that you won't find new content. We do believe that this is really leveled up and much more sophisticated, engaging than many of the things that we've been able to do in the past. Um, so uh, we talk often about the five principles of digital accessibility here. That's uh, things like text equivalence, color and contrast, uh, structured content. That is all gonna be there, those nuts and bolts. But we've also added in some really exciting new types of modules, including a whole piece that uh, kind of goes into the psychology of designing for cognition, as well as uh, things related to adopting others' materials. How do we sort of work with uh, existing content that's out on uh, on the web and in digital spaces? And then finally, really brought in a piece about advocacy and action. One thing that we've learned along the way as we've done these different challenges is that a big part of why people want to participate in them is to become part of this community that is really growing on campus that's creating kind of a bigger culture shift towards inclusivity. Um, so that last piece really speaks to that and helping people understand how these digital skills you might be learning also can kind of play this bigger role in, in that sort of growing attempt to create our campus uh, in sort of through a more inclusive lens overall. So uh, as I've been sort of alluding to, I'm, the first thing I'm gonna do today is uh, in terms of a, uh, a sneak peek, I wanna share with you one of our really high quality videos that was created. I see that Anna Croyle is in the room and she <laughs> is her video that I'm going to be um, uh, showcasing for you. This one is specifically uh, about a module that's talking about alternative text and in, in uh, sort of descriptive images. And um, and we start every single module. There's 11 across the course. We start everyone with sort of one of these really engaging short snippets of a video. And so that sort of sets the tone. I'm going to make sure this is open uh, a little bit bigger here. Bear with me. I'm gonna press play, hopefully the volume will be all right and you folks can hear it okay on your end. The great content we share and provide should be accessible to every member of our audience. But how do you capture the meaning, context, or beauty of an image? Hi, I'm Anna Croyle, a data visualization specialist for institutional research at SUNY Oswego. I'm a white woman in my mid twenties with wavy brown hair. Text equivalents communicate the meaning of an image or visual in a different format text without solely relying on the image itself. A group of scientists use particularly poetic text descriptions to describe the beauty of images of space captured by the James Webb Space Telescope. A star field is speckled across the image. They range from small, faint points of light to larger, closer, brighter, and more fully resolved stars with eight-point diffraction spikes. The upper right portion of the image has wispy, translucent cloud-like streaks rising from the nebula. In this module, we'll work together to develop clear contextual text equivalents for visuals to create more accessible digital content. So I, I hope you get a sense. This is one of, I think it's one of the most beautiful images that we've seen in terms of using descriptive text um, and such a great example in terms of sort of how a scientist might uh, effectively try and convey meaning behind an image that Oftentimes, I know historically in the past, I might have just said decorative image, you know, um, or something that is is nowhere near um, sort of uh, suitable for conveying the true meaning and understanding of what that image is really showcasing. 
uh, these types of videos are, are meant to sort of tee up the main concept of each module. Um, but then really uh, what we see throughout each of the modules from that point on is really integrative activities and all different types of things to make sure that you have opportunities to practice the skill set, uh, compare your notes with kind of best practices, and then ultimately submit assignments for points. So let me come back to my slides here. So uh, with that, I do want to talk a little bit about kind of the actual pilot that that we are uh, in the middle of. So, so far, we've got 35 folks enrolled. I'm so thankful. I'm sure many of you in the room have enrolled in the pilot this spring. Uh, it starts officially today. So if you enrolled a week ago, if you haven't been back in the class, um, now every module is there. It's open. It's ready for you to uh, start interacting with. And our goal is to run the pilot for the next few weeks till the end of the spring breakout session. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that we think that three weeks is the time that everybody must always uh, use to go through this coursework. I think that there it is certainly self-guided and self-paced. But for us, in terms of trying to gather some data and use parts of the summer to um, to then refine and, and continue working on this, we're, we're using the container of the spring breakouts as sort of our start and end time. Um, we do think that although there are 11 modules, that this is a reasonable uh, amount of time to get through the amount of content that we have there for folks. But at the same time, that's one of the things we're trying to understand is how long uh, it's taking uh, people to complete the work and, and any challenges that they're running into in terms of navigating the content that we're sharing. So there are a few different points of time that we will be sort of checking in over the um, the pilot period, which wouldn't necessarily be happening when we are doing a more um, sort of like ongoing asynchronous running of this course. But for now, since we're still trying to make sure that we've got it right and, and when we're in a period where we can, in a more controlled environment, make changes, we're really thankful for anybody that's willing to participate in that pilot. Um, and, and if anybody's here today and has not enrolled in it, I am happy to... Uh, talk for a moment here about what, what it's like to self-enroll and how that all works. Um, I do wanna just note the fact that, that an asynchronous format for learning isn't everybody's favorite. And we know that that's true. Um, I think that there is uh, a growing interest in asynchronous learning, but at the same time, we also uh, have uh, at least attempted to continue offering some additional accessibility related sessions during spring breakouts that are more synchronous, such as the format today, but also uh, a few others coming up that I want to draw everyone's attention to. Tomorrow at nine in the morning, uh, we've got uh, Exploring Ramps. This is with Sean and Rebecca. This is a model that they'll be sharing about really key action idle, actionable ways that you can kind of get involved in promoting accessibility on campus. And then in a few weeks, we've got our Accessibility Fellows Roundtable. And so if you aren't familiar with the fellows, they are a group of folks on campus who are dedicated to not only sort of ensuring that their coursework is accessible, that they are working with and developing for their students, but really acting as ambassadors across campus for accessibility. So our newest group of fellows is going to be sharing some of their experiences, but we're also kicking off the... Uh, sort of recruitment for our next round of fellows at the same time. So those things are coming up. The last thing that I want to just share and show uh, is that I'll put this into the chat. This is our, our sign up page of how you can uh, join the pilot if you have not yet. Let me find my chat. Um, so that link is now in the chat as well. This brings you to our landing page and this uh, through here, you can learn a little bit more about the course, but then when you get to the bottom, you've got the self-enrollment instructions here, and that's really where you want to start. Um, really, you're going to go through Brightspace to do it, but there is a there is a kind of step-by-step -step set of instructions I will show you through here that walks you through finding the Discover tool now uh, and then being able to jo then join that course. There is no cost to anybody to participate in this, and it is not a credit-bearing course. So this is, uh, there will be a certificate you receive at the end of this, but uh, this is, we we should consider this professional development. Um, the last thing that I will say about that is that we have had a few people run into some weird sort of snafus with the self-enrollment process. It goes through this Discover tool, 
And we've found, for example, one hole in the system is that if you've worked for a, pre a different SUNY prior to working at Oswego and they didn't have Brightspace Discover, we have to sort of reconfigure your account to make sure you get that. So if anybody goes through these uh, self-enrollment instructions and you find yourself something not matching up exactly, please let me know and I will be happy to um, you know, make sure you get to the right place. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and see if anybody has any questions, comments, or uh, if you've started, if you're part of the pilot and you kind of have started playing around and you just kind of want to chat or have some clarifications, happy to uh, kind of tackle any of those things. I have a question. Yeah, you, you, you. Oh, no. <laughs> we have, we have the technicians. Yeah, there's no easy way to do that. Um, hey, hey, Maggie, I can you for just this. No, that won't do it. You just have to mute the microphone up on the main one and then work off Maggie's mic and speaker. The technical challenge this, you know? We've found ourselves with a digital barrier. <laughs> now, go ahead. Okay. I, um, uh, this is Allison AI, Office of Learning Services. I started the module this week, module one, and one of the checklist items was to download um, Grackle Docs into Google Drive. And um, it said that I already had it installed and I cannot find where it is. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this, um, so great news that you already have it installed, I guess that's the first thing, right? Um, in terms of um, how it operates is that you, if you hadn't had it installed, right, it, it, it sort of overlays on top of your Google Docs. So what that means is that when you were, if you were to now, now that you know that you have it, if you were to go and create a Google document, then there are uh, checkers that are within that document that will you'll be able to use in that Google Doc. So it's not its own, like once you download it, it's not its own separate software tool. It is sort of baked in then to the Google Docs. And you will uh, be sort of walked through in some upcoming modules, then how to use that for your uh, setup. So essentially, you were a little bit ahead of the game because you had already had it. it. It's perhaps the version that you have. Not everybody's computer had it already um, downloaded into it. So, um, so feel free to check the checklist off, item off, and then um, you'll be ready to go once we get into the structured content module where you'll be asked to use it. Thank or you. Rather taught how to use it. <laughs> so, Maggie showed me where to find it in extensions. Perfect. Other questions or comments? Could I ask Michelle? Yeah, go ahead, Rebecca. Um, so I'm signed up for the course. I haven't started it yet, but I'm very excited about it. Um, I wonder too, and I assume in the course, I'll be able to sort of submit some of my items I'm developing for my courses and I hope get some feedback and everything. I wonder if, if as part of the larger conversation on campus you're all having, um, if there's if there's any sense that you could develop a type of um, like assessment service where I could like, could I just hand someone knowledgeable on campus, like my whole course <laughs> um, and perhaps have someone like, just like do a diagnostic and like prioritize for me. Okay. Like, listen, this is, you know, when you go to remake things, like prioritize this, like the, the alternative text for images are where like you will get the most bang for your buck in your future revisions. And then like a, a year later, I'll have that under control. And then like, I could work on something else, right? I mean, I have Grackle, you know, I do like, I do a lot of stuff already. Um, and that's awesome. And so then it's a sense of like, well, what's, you know, what's going to be the next best step to continue to enhance the accessibility of my courses? Yeah. Like I need like a consultation. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. So I have lots of um, sort of responses to that about how we can support you. So the first thing that I would say is uh, from a resources perspective, there are different groups of folks on campus that sort of are able to um, provide you with that exactly like that one-on-one -on -one support. So the, the first place would be if there has been an accessibility fellow in your sort of uh, sphere of influence, uh, anybody current or previous, they are sort of part of their charge is to work with other faculty members and kind of in that, in my case, right, in, in management and marketing, my department, I'm kind of that go-to person. That's the first thing like the closest person to you, right? Now, knowing the faculty are all busy and that can get crazy, um, you also um, can reach out to the work group and accessibility practices or our instructional designer team. But all, all of those groups can help. The other thing though that I want to just uh, draw your attention to, if you're not familiar with, there is sort of like a first step of that, which is Blackboard Ally, I'm sorry, uh, Brightspace Ally. So this is a tool built in that gives you that checklist that you're talking about that sort of says, here's all the accessibility problems. Um, and so we've got a handful of different um, recorded sessions on how to do that and how to sort of take advantage of that tool, because that would give you that first look without having to like make an appointment with anybody and sit down with it. So that at least gives you some clear actionable things to say like, hey, these couple of PDFs you've gotten here or these you know pieces of information, but that presumes that you are... For me, that works. I teach all online, right? And for if if you're if you're looking at trying to make materials uh, accessible that are outside the scope of Brightspace, then that doesn't necessarily serve you for that same purpose. So the answer is yes. I would say that we aren't at a, a capacity place where we can be like the perfect concierge for everybody. Like if everybody on campus was like, "Here's my four classes. Can you help me with these?" But in terms of uh, developing some resources and relationships there, we can definitely get you on your way and help you kind of figure out where those, where your best efforts would be served. Thank you. I love that. I love that a lot. It's a matter of like, you know, figuring out what I don't know, right? I mean, I can do the PDFs now. I can do like, I've been following you for years now and I appreciate all of it. Um, and so then it's like, but like, what don't I know um, to help me with that? So I appreciate that. Thank you. Great. The other thing I would say is I love that that's sort of your mindset about it, right? Because I think even those of us who are doing this work a lot um, find ourselves that we're kind of in that constant improvement as well, right? And we'll run into things where we're like, this is a thing in my course that I've never been able, I know this is not accessible as it is, and I haven't figured out how to sort it out. But then we learn about a new technology or somebody comes up with a new resource for it or a workaround, and then we can kind of go back through and, and add in those new versions. So each of us that I think that are really deep into this work do see it as sort of what's that next step? What's the next bite that we can you know chew off to continue trying to make things more and more accessible uh, without sort of the uh, expectation that we're all shooting for perfect straight out of the gate, because any improvements are going to, are, are definitely going to improve the overall experience. Other questions or clarifications? All right. Well, with that, I am happy. I'm going to also put my email address in the chat box. Um, that way, if anybody has any trouble signing up, if you want to, or, uh, get starts to get underway in the, uh, access course and find yourself, um, needing some additional support or help, we would love to kind of really engage, uh, intentionally over the next couple of weeks with everybody, keep an eye out for, uh, sort of quick polls and, you know, kind of questions from us over the next few weeks as we're trying to assess how it's going for everybody. But thank you all for being here today for the kickoff. And uh, I'm eager to see and hear from all of you uh, over the next few weeks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Any remaining grading? We'll be back here tomorrow with everything working. Okay.